Do you remember studying anti-avoidance in your tax lectures at university? Remember that stuff? It's every taxpayer's right to arrange their affairs so that they pay the least amount of tax. And if you don't like it, you'll take them to court. Well, recently in the Supreme Court of Appeals, there's been what some hail to be a controversial land-breaking judgment about the parameters of tax planning. And a lot has been written in the press about CSARS versus NWK. This is what it's all about. If you have ever had the pleasure to meet the great tax consultant Pierre de Toy, he will explain the tax morality spectrum to you as follows. He says, draw a line. Put up two posts on it, one on the left, that's where you go to jail if you, nev if you never register for tax. On the right, you will go insolvent if you never claim a tax deduction. And he says, then look at some characters. We'd take Arianassus and we would say, he said, there are no rules. He represents the left. And Trevor Manuel reckons that there's a sort of morality in tax. He can represent the right. And we have to find a barrier somewhere between. Where is the happy ground? And we've got Anassas pulling left and Manuel pulling right. Let's start off with the oldest judgments, which say, It is trite law that His Majesty's subjects are free if they can to make their own arrangements. I.e., you can push this thing as far as you like. Now, without delving into that, you must be a fool if you think you can go that far. So you can wipe that, one, that old judgment out. Where one really starts off making some progress in the debate is when one looks at what one calls an infraudum legis transaction. Now, this is defined in a principle from a case called Zunberg versus Van Sale from 1910, i.e. over 100 years ago. And this is where it is identified that the parties to a transaction endeavor to conceal its real character. They call it by a name or give it a shape intended not to express but to disguise its true nature. And when a court is asked to decide any rights under such an, an agreement, it can only do so by giving effect to what the transaction really is, not what in form it purports to be. And that's where we get the Latin maxim, plus vale quad agita quam quad simulate concepita. In short, bullshitters will not be tolerated. And this has been accepted by the courts for many, many years. The parties must give an effect to their transaction according to their tenor, and that's accepted in Earth 3183, Ladysmith, Relia, Conhagi, etc., etc., etc. But now in CSARS versus NWK, Lewis wants to go further. She says, this test should go further and require an examination of the commercial sense of the transaction, of its real substance and purpose. Very importantly now, if the purpose of the transaction is only to achieve an object that allows the evasion of tax or of a preemptory law, then it will be regarded as a simulation. Going even further. And the mere fact that the parties do perform in terms of the contract does not mean that it is not simulated. This is breaking new ground. The charade of performance is generally meant to give credence to the simulation. Now, Carrying on further, she even says, in my view, the test to determine simulation cannot simply be whether it is an intention to give effect to a contract in accordance with its terms. Invariably, where parties structure a transaction to achieve an objective other than one ostensibly achieved, they will intend to give effect to their transaction on the terms agreed. If that wasn't shock enough, it goes even further. Previously, we've had cases which give you the principle, the mere fact that the same result can be achieved via a different route does not imply simulation. And that's been put there by cases such as Dardu v. Krugerstorp Municipality and Commissioners of Customs and Excise v. Randall's Brothers and Hudson. Now Lewis J. comes out boxing again says, if the purpose of a transaction is only to achieve an object that allows the evasion of tax, then it will be regarded as a simulation. What is Lewis achieving? Lewis is taking the box with infratum legis transactions and taking it further away from Manassas and bringing it towards Trevor Manuel, saying you've got to go further, we're going to look into this in more detail.
Some say that this goes as far as the substance over form debate, i.e. those old judgments such as Inland Revenue Commissioners versus Duke of Westminster, where Lord Tomlin back in 1936 said, it is said that in revenue cases there is a doctrine that the court may ignore the legal position and regard what is called the substance of, of the matter. The sooner this misunderstanding is dispelled and the supposed doctrine given its quietus, the better it will be for all concerned, for the doctrine seems to involve substituting the uncertain and crooked cord of discretion for the golden and straight meter wand of the law. It doesn't go as far as substance over form. But we could say, what does general anti-avoidance achieve? Does this not achieve the same purpose? Now, very important, the NWK case was ju judged at a time that Section 103 was still in place. We've now got the general anti-avoidance regulations contained in Section 80. And they go a lot further than the old Section 103. Because in Section 80A, it says an avoidance arrangement is an impermissible avoidance arrangement if its sole or main purpose was to obtain a tax benefit. And then it goes, and in the context of business, was entered into or carried out by a means or a manner which would not normally be employed for bona fide business purposes. And then it even goes further into what is commercial substance in Section 80C. We don't need to go there. We just need to look at that opening paragraph and say, was this arrangement made with the sole or main purpose of obtaining a tax benefit? So let's make some concluding remarks here. Does CSARS versus NWK change the parameters of tax planning as we know it? The answer is maybe, but very importantly, each case depends on its own facts. We can't just go quoting this thing shotgun all over the place. Then we ask the question, did the Supreme Court of Appeals make up its mind and then write the judgment to justify its findings? Again, maybe, but that's where we stand if we want to go to the Supreme Court of Appeals today. And then we must ask the very real question, isn't this all just academic? We've got now Section 80 and General Anti-Avoidance Regulations, which would probably throw this case out anyway. So maybe this is just a history lesson. But very importantly, the principle comes up, do you still want to go to the Supreme Court of Appeals? Now, I think that's a relevant question. What the Supreme Court of Appeals is saying is, don't come in here lightly. Don't think the Supreme Court is just going to go in there and help the taxpayer out of a difficult predicament. Cases will be fought on the basis of no quarter asked or given. So what do you think? Do you think the taxpayer has been done? Or do you think that Lewis got it right? The call is yours. But if you want to go to the Supreme Court of Appeals, it might cost you a lot of money to make that call.